Would you please open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2? Ephesians chapter 2. We'll be there in just a minute. Uh, John and Emily are away enjoying a much needed break. And John will be back next week to continue our series. But today you're stuck with me. Uh, my name is Aaron Ferguson. I'm one of the elders here. It's a pleasure to serve you as an elder. And uh, if you are new with us today, thank you for being here. We have a place just in the lobby called New Here, and we would love to meet you and uh, get to know that you are here today. Uh, the rest of you, I do not get this chance very often, and so let me just say on behalf of the Elder Council that uh, we are grateful for you. We are uh, grateful for your faithful attendance and grateful for your faithful service. Many of you serve all across the campus in various ministries. Thank you. And thank you for your faithful giving and um, your faithful study of God's word. It's my pleasure to lead that study this morning in Ephesians chapter two. Now, John, the last two weeks, uh, has preached in a very low chair and uh, I am so grateful I don't have to do that today for a couple of reasons. Number one, I'm not cool enough to do that. But number two, I'm getting to the age where if I sat that long, that low to the floor, I probably wouldn't be able to get up and uh, they'd have to carry me off the stage. And so that would be very embarrassing. So I'm glad I don't have to do that. And I'm getting to the age now where I, I used to be able to preach with a small piece of paper and I could read the fine print and uh, now I have this massive notebook with massive print in it and uh, I have to wear these. Anybody have to wear these? Uh, I know a lot of you have been wearing these your whole life and I'm very sorry for that because these are no fun at all. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, uh, Eve ate that fruit because it was good for the eyes. I think that was a lie. It was not good for the eyes at all. Uh, poor eyesight is part of the curse, I'm convinced. And uh, that's probably why I don't eat fruit either, because it's part of the curse. But uh, anyway, the good news about losing your eyesight is that I'm starting to, I think, get better looking in my old age, as far as I can tell, in the mirror. Uh, so there are some benefits. Uh, we are in a series called First Things First, looking at essential doctrines of the Christian life, sort of those first tier, first level beliefs, the big rocks that we should all agree on. And uh, as I watched John last week put these rocks in here, I leaned over to my wife and said, I hope there's room for my rock. Uh, and so I asked this morning to, for the rocks to be put in here before I preached because I was afraid that I wouldn't stack them properly and my rock wouldn't fit in the jar like it's supposed to. So you could say that John's a little bolder than I am, but uh, <laughs> I am not going to put these rocks in here. But I am gonna review. Uh, so far we've looked at five big rocks, big tier issues. Uh, and we started with <clears throat> God's revelation how he has revealed himself to us through Christ, through creation, through his word. We believe the Bible is God's word. And then we looked at week two, God's attributes. Who is God? What is he like? And then we looked at the person of the Trinity, the person of Christ, and then last week, humanity. Uh, who are we? And why are we here? What are we like? And uh, 
I guess you could say we're off to a rocky start, but it's going to get better today because we're doing the doctrine of salvation. So uh, why is the doctrine of salvation a big rock that we need to spend a whole sermon on it? Well, it's really the heart of the gospel. It's the heart of the entire Bible. The message of the entire Bible from beginning to end is God redeeming fallen people. And so when we talk salvation, we're really getting right to the heart of what God wants to say to us. And besides that, we answer some of life's big questions with the doctrine of salvation, like why am I here and and what's wrong with me? And what can I do about it? Uh, how can I be made right with God again? And, and what happens to me when I die? Now, those are some big questions that the doctrine of salvation is going to answer. So this is a foundation stone, a big rock for sure. And it's so big and intimidating that uh, we could spend a year of sermons on this doctrine, you understand on Wednesday night, I'm going to try to go in a lot more deeply than I am this morning. This morning, I'm gonna to try to keep this very simple, and I'm gonna do that by asking and answering six questions. So you'll see uh, there on your notes the six questions, and I'm just gonna dive right in and begin to answer these questions. So what is salvation? What is salvation? The Greek word for salvation literally means to save or to rescue, to save or to rescue. Uh, Noah Webster's definition of salvation is the act of saving or preserving someone from danger or destruction. The act of saving or preserving someone from danger or destruction. Okay, well that caused me to ask five more questions. Uh, who is it that needs to be saved? Who needs to be saved? Why do we need to be saved? Who is it that does the saving? How are we saved? And what are the benefits of being saved? All five questions can be answered in our key passage today, Ephesians chapter two, verses one through 10. So would you join me there? Ephesians chapter two, verses one through 10. This is an incredible passage, and the gospel is just richly described, and I'm going to try to make it as simple as I can. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, and you, Christians, Paul's talking to Christians, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, and because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace have you been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace have you been saved through faith and this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God not a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Well, let's pray together. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this passage on salvation. I pray now that you would help me to make it as clearly clear as I can. Pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to understand what it is you have done for us in this wonderful gift of salvation. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, let's answer that second question. Who is it that needs to be saved? Who is it that needs to be saved? We'll find the answer in verse three. If you'll go back to verse three, Paul is speaking to Christians 
and he's describing our lives before salvation, that we all lived in a way that displeased God. Read this verse with me again. Among whom we, Christians, all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. If you like to underline, circle, highlight words, encourage you to to underline, highlight, circle in verse three, we all, we all, Paul says, we all, Christians included, used to live in a way that displeased God, and then underline, highlight, circle, like the rest of mankind. All of us live in a way that displeases God. In other words, everyone needs to be saved. Salvation is for everyone. Everyone needs salvation. Without salvation, we are doomed, which Paul is gonna go on to explain more here in just a minute. Why? Why do we need to be saved? Let's answer question number three. Why do we need to be saved? Paul describes what we are like before salvation in verses one through three. Let me just read some of these statements. Verse one, he says, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Verse two, we follow the prince of the power of the air. Also in verse two, we follow the course of this world. And then also in verse two, we are sons of disobedience. And then in verse three, we are children of wrath. Without salvation, our condition is hopeless. And what he's trying to show us is we are hopeless without salvation. So let me just for a a minute here explain those five statements as best I can. Number one, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Genesis chapter two, God tells Adam and Eve not to eat from a certain tree, but listen to verse 17. In the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. In the day that you disobey me, you will surely die. What God is doing there, right at the beginning of our Bibles, is establishing a principle. Death is a penalty for disobedience. Death is a penalty for sin. If you obey me, you live. If you disobey me, you die. And of course, we know what happens. Adam and Eve disobey God. They rebel against him and sin enters through the world and they die, not immediately physically, but they died spiritually. They will die later physically. Death is a penalty for sin. It's part of the curse of the fall. You're familiar with Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. You know that, Romans 5 In verse 12, just as sin entered the world through one man, that's Adam, death through sin, Paul says, remember that death is the penalty for sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. We are born spiritually dead. The Bible says we're conceived in sin. We are spiritually dead. I know you're alive physically. Someday you're going to die physically. But right now, we are born spiritually dead before salvation. So why do we need to be saved? We are dead in our trespasses and sins. And then Paul says we follow the prince of the power of the air. What in the world does that mean? That's just a description of Satan, whom Jesus called the prince of demons, the ruler of this world. You and I know we live in a physical world, tangible world that we can see and touch, but there's another world world, a spiritual world we can't see and we can't touch, and Satan is a very much a real part of that world, and he's the ruler of that spiritual darkness. That's why Paul says, Ephesians chapter six, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, what we can see and touch, but against the rulers, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, the other world, against the spiritual forces of evil, in heavenly places. Satan is the prince of that darkness, that spiritual darkness Paul is talking about. You and I are born dead in our trespasses and sins, and we're also born 
into spiritual darkness. And that means Satan has a great deal of influence and control in our lives before salvation. We are dead and we are in darkness is the way Paul is describing this. Listen to Colossians chapter one, verse 13. When we are saved, when we give our lives to Christ, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son into light. Before salvation, we are dead and we are in darkness, trapped in Satan's control, the prince of the power of the air. That's how we are, that's how we come into this world. And then Paul says, we follow the course of this world. What does that mean? Because we are born dead and we are born in that spiritual darkness and Satan has a lot of control and influence in our lives, uh, he's working to conform us into his image. He's working to mold us into his image, the views and values of this fallen world. That's why Paul says in Romans 12, do not be conformed to this world. Satan is trying to mold you, shape you into his image. This world is fallen, broken, sinful, but that's what Satan is trying to mold you into. Listen to 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Do not love the world. Do not love the things in the world. Why not? Because they are not of God. They are of the world. Satan is influencing you, controlling you to mold you into his image and he wants you to follow the course of this world. Our condition before salvation is hopeless, spiritually dead, dark, under the control, the influence of Satan and he's molding us the way he wants us. Before salvation, we are hopeless And then Paul calls us in verse two, sons of disobedience. Why does he call us sons of disobedience? In our sin, we don't love God. We love ourselves. In our sin, we don't obey God. We do what we wanna do. We disobey God. Remember, we're under Satan's control and he wants us to rebel against God just like he did and disobey his commands. That's why Paul says in Romans 3, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God because we are rotten, fallen, just like our first parents. We've inherited that sinful nature. Later, Paul says in Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Just like Adam and Eve, they disobeyed God They handed down that sinful nature to their descendants. That's us. We are disobedient to God at first. We don't have a choice. That's our nature. We are sons of disobedience. And then verse three, Paul says we are children of wrath. Because we are born dead, we're born into that darkness, we're under Satan's control, we rebel against God just like he did We disobey his commands. We deserve God's wrath, his judgment, his punishment. Why do we need to be saved? Because our condition before salvation is hopeless. Now, there's more to the story. Aren't you glad? There's good news this morning. Let's answer question number four. Who does the saving? Who does the saving? If we are dead in our trespasses and sins, dead men can't resuscitate themselves. Who does the saving? Well, perhaps the sweetest words in this passage you need to underline, highlight, circle, star, beginning of verse four, but God. But God. You were born dead in your trespasses and sin, but God made you alive. You were born into spiritual darkness, but God transferred you into the kingdom of his son, into light. You were, you were, you were, but God, but God. So then who does the saving? 
It's God alone who does the saving. Salvation is entirely a work of God. We cannot save ourselves. God has to do the saving. Salvation is entirely a work of God. But why would he do that? Why would he do that? Paul goes on, verses four and five, but God, listen to some key words, being rich in mercy, God is merciful. Because of his great love, God is loving with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, something we do not deserve, by grace have you been saved. He is merciful, he is loving, he is gracious. That's why he decided to save us. Listen to Titus 3. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his mercy. God is merciful. Romans chapter five, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God is loving. 2 Timothy 1 verse nine, God who saved us and called us to a holy calling not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. God is gracious. Mercy, love, and grace. We didn't deserve it. We couldn't earn it. He had to do it for us. Salvation is entirely a work of God, not of our own doing. Skip on down there in Ephesians 2 to verse 10. I love this. Paul says, we are his workmanship, Shorten that to, we are his work. It's his work. He's the one that saves us, not ourselves. We were dead once, but God gave us life. We were rotten, but God made us right. We were slaves once, but God set us free. If no but God, where would we be? Only by the grace of God are we saved. Who does the saving? Salvation is entirely a work of God. How does he do it? How are we saved? Let's answer that question. How are we saved? You know, the world would say we're saved by our works, things that we can do. We can earn the righteousness of God. You know, before sin entered into the world, that might have been true. Adam and Eve were told, if you obey me, you live. If you disobey, you die. Their lives were dependent on their obedience, their works. But you and I know what happened. They disobeyed, they rebelled against God, and sin entered into the world, and you and I inherited that sinful nature. So now, after sin, works don't work. We fall short of God's standard of righteousness. We are incapable of earning salvation. So God had to make a way for us to be saved. How did he do it? He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who came conceived by the spirit, born of a virgin, and who lived a sinless life meaning that he obeyed God perfectly, which Adam did not do. Christ obeyed God perfectly, lived a sinless life, and that penalty for sin is still there. Death is still the penalty for sin. But God said this, because my son has lived a sinless life, I will accept his death on your behalf. I will accept his sacrifice and spare you the penalty for your sin. So he died on a cross for you and for me. That sinless life God took and he gave it to you and he took your sin and he put it on Christ and Christ 
sacrificed himself on that cross for you to have salvation. You and I cannot save ourselves. Only God can do the work, and he did the work through his son, Jesus Christ. But how? How are we saved? Paul answers this question in verses eight and nine. We're saved by grace. We don't deserve it. Through faith. Through faith. What is faith? Faith is a trust in what Christ has done on our behalf. We believe that his work on the cross will save us from the penalty of sin. If we put our faith in Jesus, God will accept his death on our behalf and he will give us eternal life and righteousness, right standing with him instead. He exchanges Christ's righteousness for our sinfulness through faith. We have to trust that, believing that that is true. I've had a suitcase up here this whole time. You've been wondering why it's here. If you were planning on going on a trip for about a year and you had a lot of things that you need to get in order to do that, a lot of packing to do, and a friend came to you and said, you don't have to do a thing. I've packed your bag for you. Really? Yes, I've packed your bag for you. Everything you need for a year is in that suitcase. Would you believe your friend and would you trust your friend that he's got everything in the bag that you need? Yeah, I don't think so. No, 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 it's in the bag. Did you remember to get... It's in the bag. Really? Okay. I believe you. I trust you. I'm gonna put my faith in you and accept that the suitcase has everything I need. God the Father has made a way for you and I to be right with him again, to be saved from the penalty of sin to escape the curse of death and have eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, God has offered you a free gift. You have done nothing to deserve it, nothing to earn it. It's just his grace, his goodness. Everything you need to be right with God, to live eternally with him in heaven, Everything you need to have new life, new hope, a second chance, <clears throat> it's in the bag. What do you do? Put your hope and faith and trust in the God. Do you trust God at his word? Do you believe that the gift has everything you need to be right with him again? What's in the bag? What are the benefits of salvation? Well, let's answer that last question. What are the benefits of salvation? To be honest with you, they are endless. They are endless. The benefits of being saved are endless. I could spend a year of sermons on this. We're gonna try to dive a little more deeply on Wednesday nights, uh, Wednesday, this coming Wednesday night at 6.15, right in here. I'll try to answer that question a little more fully, but there are three benefits in this passage. Verse five, Paul says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. One of the benefits of salvation is you're not dead anymore, you have new life in Christ. You're not spiritually dead, you're spiritually alive in him. He has resurrected your dead spirit and made it alive with Christ. You're no longer part of Satan's dominion. You're not in that darkness anymore. You've been transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son. You are now in the light with Christ. New life right here on earth, a second chance. Verse 10, Paul says we have a new mission and a new purpose in life. We are his workmanship, Paul says. 
created in Christ Jesus for good works. We have a new mission and a new purpose in life. God has things for us to do after salvation, like telling other people the good news of salvation. We have a new mission, a new purpose to walk and live for Christ. And then verse six, Paul says, we have eternal life. He raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We no longer have to fear the curse and the penalty of sin because we have life eternal. We don't have to fear death anymore. Physical death, spiritual death, it's in the bag, eternal life. The doctrine of salvation is amazing, but it's more than just a doctrine. We're talking the difference between life and death. And you and I can only stand back and say, we have an amazing God. We don't understand it all. I didn't deserve any of this, but thank you, God. You are gracious and good and merciful. Thank you, God, for the gift of salvation. And that's why I love verse seven. In the coming ages, he might show us the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You know why we get to live eternally with Jesus Christ and God? Because it's gonna take an eternity to praise him for everything that he's done for us. The benefits are endless and it's gonna take all of eternity to thank him for everything he's done for us. That's amazing. We were dead once, but God gave us life. We were rotten, but God made us right. We were slaves once, but God set us free. If no but God, where would we be? The doctrine of salvation, beautiful, powerful, transformative. Some of you I know in this room have put your faith in Christ and you've been walking with him faithfully your whole life. He is your life. You live for him. You share others, share with others what he's done for you. Some of you, uh, a better description might be, you know what God has done for you, and you are hanging on to Christ with everything you've got. Not because you've earned your salvation or you're gonna lose it, but because you know what God has done for you in salvation. Some of you are not so sure You've heard me today, but you're like, yeah, I don't know about that. I'll save myself. I'll trust in myself. Well, I've got bad news for you. That's a dead end. You are spiritually dead. You're in the kingdom of darkness. You're under the control, the influence of the enemy and you are rotten to the core. And one of these days, you're gonna have to stand in front of the Lord and be held accountable for what you have done. At that point, it's too late. You will be judged, you'll be sentenced, you'll be condemned to an eternal punishment in a place called hell. Do not miss your opportunity today to accept the free gift of God in salvation.